of the many iconic stories written by Chris Claremont on Uncanny X-Men, God Loves, Man Kills holds a position of rare prominence. It is the first X-Men graphic novel. It is a mainstay on lists of the top X-Men stories of all time. It was the basis for the movie X2, and it is easily the X-Men story most prominently featured on University Course Syllabi. Also, it is completely uncontested, in my mind, for having the greatest title in X-Men history, maybe comics history. So where did it come from, and what makes it special? From a publishing standpoint, God Loves, Man Kills was part of a landmark transition in comics history. Will Eisner coined the term graphic novel just four years prior with the launch of his iconic A Contract with God book. Despite that auspicious launch, the graphic novel as a concept didn't really take off right away. Perhaps counterintuitively, it was Marvel's adoption of the graphic novel platform in the early 1980s that really popularized the new medium of prestige, more adult-oriented superhero comics. And God Loves Man Kills was the fifth in Marvel's new line. Interestingly, number four was also by Claremont, and featured the debut of the New Mutants. The original plan for God Loves Man Kills had been for legendary X-Men storyteller Neil Adams to team up with Claremont by handling penciling duty. But after a few pages of work, this fell through over contractual terminology and Adams' commitment to creator's rights, leaving Brent Anderson, with his soft, sketchy style, to fill in. Prior to this, Anderson had been approached to replace Dave Cockrum, who was departing Uncanny X-Men for the second time, but Anderson did not feel up to the task, however, of UXM's grueling production schedule, and had to decline, requesting work in a more one-off format instead, something that God Loves Man Kills provided him. The story itself was inspired by Claremont's observation of the 1980s evangelical movement, led by Billy Graham, Jerry Falwell, and others. Claremont felt that this movement held a monolithic perception of religion, a polarizing us-versus-them mentality that was vulnerable to paradox. It also held for Claremont a coordinated push toward political influence, despite America's claim of separation between church and state, something that he also viewed problematically. It was the vulnerability to paradox, though, that Claremont wanted to expose by inserting his mutants into the mix and allowing them to draw out the inherent cruelty of American fundamentalism and literalist interpretations of the Bible. Claremont researched the story by studying both the Bible and by familiarizing himself with the broadcasts of Sunday morning televangelicals. The story opens with the shocking lynching of a pair of mutant children, signaling immediately to the reader the darker tone of the narrative, as well as its potential to integrate long-simmering X-Men symbols which sought to analogize mutant bodies with black ones. It is Magneto who arrives to grieve these children, symbolizing an important milestone in the face turn of his character, one of the defining projects of Claremont's post-burn run, and a key development in the series push away from the problematic model minority metaphor that had once defined it. The Magneto that we see here is not a mustache-twirling Silver Age comics villain. Standing over the bodies of murdered children, as he is, this Magneto makes some valid points. So much so, in fact, that even the righteously committed Professor Xavier wavers in his commitment to his dream and considers joining Magneto's mission of vengeance, but is ultimately brought back to the fold through the commitment of his greatest pupil, Cyclops. The centerpiece of the story, though, is Reverend William Stryker, a man of misguided faith, one based in his own personal rationalizations, but also a man of great means, including a charismatic presence ideally suited to influence the hearts and minds of his flock through mass media, a textbook example of a cult of personality. Importantly, Stryker is not a villain that the X-Men can defeat through physical means, and thus the climax of the text falls to an ideological war instead of a punching contest, forcing the X-Men, and through them both Claremont and his readers, to explore and articulate the depth and boundaries of the X-Men's system of belief. Thus, through this conflict and its subsequent resolution, God Loves Man Kills offers the clearest and fullest articulation of the central thesis of the X-Men franchise as envisioned by Chris Claremont. Along the way, the story offers us a number of character-defining moments, evocative scenes, and imagery, and above all, a direct manifestation of a more mature approach to Marvel's mutants and the symbols that surround them. And this might be one of the most important points of God Loves Man Kills' influence. Its success as a more adult-oriented X-Men story paved the way for Claremont to continue to push the franchise in that direction for years to come, contributing quite directly to the evolution of Uncanny X-Men and through X-Men's broader influence on the industry as a whole, to the evolution of superhero comics, and maybe even the comics' literature movement. Claremont ends his introduction to the 2003 reprint of God Loves, Man Kills as follows, quote, The irony of God Loves is that it was very much of its time and place, and yet, almost 20 years later, the sentiments and the inspirations that brought it into being retained their relevance. People are still being judged more by the color of their skin and the nation of their origin and the faith that they espouse 
than their character. And I still find myself dreaming of a time when all of that is behind us and saying, why not? Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the Claremont Run project, you can visit us on the web at www.claremontrun.com or follow us on Twitter at Claremont Run.